This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about a class of rings with the rather cumbersome name of local complete intersection rings. And as this is a bit of a mouthful to pronounce, they're often called LCI rings for short. Um, so uh, we've been talking about several classes of local rings, so I'll just briefly recall where these fit in. So we had regular local rings, which correspond to non-singular points of varieties, and these are a special sort of local complete intersection ring, which are in turn a special case of Gorenstein rings, which are in turn a special case of cohen macaulay rings, which are a special case of local rings. So in previous lectures we've covered cohen macaulay rings and Gorenstein rings and regular rings, so now we're going to do the last case which is local complete intersection rings. So first of all, what is a local complete intersection ring? Well, it's given by you take a regular local ring R, and the local complete intersection is R modulo the ideal generated by x1 up to xi, where x1 up to xi is a regular sequence. So for example, x1 is um, a non-zero divisor and a non-unit, and x2 is a non-zero divisor and a non-unit in R over x1. Um, when I first came across this definition, my reaction was it was looked like this completely artificial and rather silly definition. Um, but it does turn out to be a really fundamental and natural concept, although possibly not a completely intuitive one. The geometric meaning is as follows. Um, suppose you've got um, some sort of variety in um, n-dimensional affine space, and suppose it has co-dimension um, um, uh, k, then it needs at least k equations to define it. Um, and you can also talk about how many equations do you need to define it near a point. So that, that there's a sort of difference between the number of equations you need to define it globally and the number you need to define it locally. If, if, if we can define if we can define the local ring at a point with k equations, then we get a local complete intersection ring. So local complete intersection rings are something to do with being able to define things using the minimal possible number of equations. Um, so let's have a few examples. So first of all, all regular rings are obviously local complete intersection because you can just divide out by the empty set, which is certainly a regular sequence. So regular implies local complete intersection. Um, more generally, any hypersurface singularity is a local complete intersection local ring, because here we're just taking a regular ring and quotienting out by um, just one element. So, so this ring R will be the local ring of um, affine space. Uh, actually calling it x1 to xn may be a bit misleading as I use that for a regular sequence. So we localize this at zero and quotient out by some hypersurface function of f y1 up to yn. And then this is a non-zero divisor because this ring doesn't have any zero divisors. So any hypersurface singularity is already local complete intersection. In particular, all singularities of, say, plane algebraic curves are local complete intersection singularities. Um, if we want an example of something that's not a local complete intersection singularity, we can have a rather clumsy example where we just take a, a variety consisting of the union of a plane and a point. And at this point, this is not 
the local complete intersection. And intuitively, you can see that's true because this variety has co-dimension one in three-dimensional affine space, but there's no way you can define define it with just a single equation because it's got this co-dimension two line there. Um, that's not a terribly good example because it's not just not local complete intersection, but it's not even cohen macaulay which is a much weaker condition. So um, what we really want to do is, is find a rather better example. So first of all, we recall that being a local complete intersection implies that the ring is Gorenstein. Um, I'm not going to prove this. Um, you can prove it in a way that's not too different from the way I sketched for showing that regular implies Gorenstein. You, you just um, take a regular sequence and sort of mess around with long exact sequences involving exts and so on to calculate exts. So local complete intersection rings are Gorenstein and the problem I want to discuss is find an example of a Gorenstein ring that is not local complete intersection. Um, and um, this is actually I mean, there, there are plenty of examples, but they're not quite trivial to find. It turns out that most obvious examples of Gorenstein rings are automatically local complete intersection rings. And in fact, the by far the easiest way to write down Gorenstein rings is just to construct them as local complete intersection rings. Um, and I think that the, the way I first came across the difference between a Gorenstein ring and a local complete intersection ring was when Andrew Wiles proved Fermat's last theorem back in the 90s. And um, one of the things in his proof, I mean, one of the steps in his proof was roughly speaking, he had a, he had a Gorenstein local ring and he had to show that it was a local complete intersection ring. And, you know, this sort of rather blew everyone away because I think most people rather like me had kind of come across Gorenstein rings and local complete intersection rings as these rather technical obscure concepts in commutative algebra that we hadn't paid much attention to and all of a sudden these were appearing in this really fundamental theorem that Andrew Wiles proved and you actually needed to understand the difference between them. Um, so what I'm going to do is just a start on this by, by, by just giving an example of a, of a ring that, that is Gorenstein but not local complete intersection. We're going to check the Gorenstein and local complete intersection conditions. Um, so the example is going to be the following ring. We take the ring of polynomials in three variables and we quotient it out by the following ideal. We, we quotient it out by the ideal generated by x squared, um, xy, yz, z squared and y squared minus xz. Okay, you, you see what I mean by the fact that these these examples aren't completely obvious. You really have to think about it a bit to come up with examples like this. So first of all, let's explain why it is a Gorenstein ring. <clears throat> so first of all, we work at dimension. Well, the dimension is equal to zero. In fact, the ring obviously has length five. And now we're going to try and draw a picture of it by drawing a, a sort of block for each, each subquotient isomorphic to k. And the picture of the ring I want to draw looks something like this. So here I'm going to draw the, the whole ring as um, um, a sort of union of five blocks. So each of these blocks corresponds to, to a subquotient that's isomorphic to k. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the three ideals x, y, and z to look like this. Now the ideal x um, doesn't consist just of this box. It consists of this box together with the stuff underneath it because the ideal generated by x actually is length 2. And this thing um, down here is the ideal generated by y squared which is equal to xz. Um, and you can think of this bit here as being the whole ring and this bit here is the maximal ideal m and this bit at the bottom is the maximal ideal m squared. 
Um, and to explain where this construction comes from, we, more generally, you can take <coughs> V to be a vector space over K, which may as well be finite dimensional, and then you can take a ring um, consisting of K plus V plus another copy of K, and this K is going to contain the identity of the ring, and this vector space is going to have a symmetric bilinear form from V tensor V to K, and the product on th th this bilinear form is going to be the product on V to this bit here. So, so this is this, this is going to be the maximal ideal m squared, and this is going to be the maximal ideal m, and the, the, the map from v times v to this k is the bilinear form. Um, so you can do this with any vector space in any bilinear form, and you'll get a, you, you, you'll get a little zero-dimensional local ring. And now if the bilinear form on V is non-degenerate, this implies that the ring is Gorenstein. And that's easy because Gorenstein just means HOM over R from K to um, R has dimension 1. And if this bilinear form on V is non-degenerate, then any homomorphism from K to R must have image inside this bit here. If, if the form on V is degenerate and has something in the kernel, then, then the image of K could also be something in V, and it would no longer be Gorenstein. So you can construct Gorenstein rings from any vector space with a um, non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. That gives you lots of Gorenstein rings. Um, here we're taking V to be three-dimensional. The reason we're taking it to be three-dimensional is that if V is two-dimensional, then this turns out to be a complete intersection ring. So, so for a ring that's not complete intersection, we just have to take V of dimension at least three, and, and the simplest case is V being three-dimensional. Anyway, now we have to see that it's not a complete intersection, not, not a local complete intersection ring. And let's just give an informal argument. Um, we can write R as a quotient of Kx that the power series ring x, y, z um, modulo some ideal. And what's this ideal going to be? Well, the, the, the ideal is going to be a subring of, um, let, let's say, m squared, where m is going to be the ideal generated by x, y, and z in R, in, sorry, in K, X, Y, Z. And you notice that M squared over M cubed has dimension 6, because it's spanned by X squared, X, Y, Y squared, X, Z, Z squared, and whatever the last one is, Y, Z. Um, so in order to in order to get our ring, we need to kill off a five-dimensional subspace of m squared uh, over m cubed. So this, this is now just a vector space over k, and we need to cut it down from being six dimensions to one dimension, and obviously to do that we need to pick a five-dimensional subspace of that. Well, this needs at least five generators, sorry, at least five relations, uh, because we need at least five, we need to kill off at least five elements to cut this down. Um, however, um, k, x, y, z obviously has dimension as a ring equal to three, and r has dimension zero, so if r is a complete um, a local complete intersection, we should use at most three relations, because more or less the definition of a local complete intersection ring is that you have to use the minimum number of relations to cut it down. So this sort of strongly suggests that the ring is not a local complete intersection ring, 
I mean, it's not quite a proof because, you know, we, we have to fuss a little bit about this. I mean, we, we, we've, we've written R as a quotient of this particular ring, but maybe there's some clever way of writing R as a quotient of a ring with power series and 15 generators and using some very clever ideal or whatever. I mean, it seems unlikely, but, but proving you can't do that is really, um, you know, I mean, you can do it. It's just a little bit fussy. So, so this is a sort of sketch of a reason why it's not a local complete intersection, but it's um, not quite a complete proof. Um, so we're going to introduce another criterion for showing that something is not a local complete intersection, and this is going to use the fitting ideals that we talked about um, last lecture. And for this, we're going to use the following theorem, a naught dimensional notarian ring is a local complete intersection if and only if the zeroth fitting ideal of the maximal ideal is not equal to zero. So this is a nice criterion for local complete intersection rings. Um, well, before we use that, um, let's say, what happens if your ring isn't zero dimensional? Well, there's an extension of this theorem to higher dimensions. And one version of this was actually introduced by Wiles in his um, work on Fermat's last theorem, and Wiles's version of this has since been simplified and generalised quite a bit. So, so there are there are theorems that will tell you about whether or not a high-dimensional Noetherian ring is a local complete intersection ring. Um, we're not going to worry about that. Instead, we're going to use a rather rather simpler criterion, which which says that a local complete intersection, sorry, uh, a ring R, so a local ring R of dimension greater than naught is a local complete intersection if r over x1 is a local complete intersection where x1 of course is not a unit or zero divisor. So you can reduce the case of testing whether positive dimensional rings are local complete intersection to zero dimensional rings by killing off by a regular sequence, and then you can test the zero-dimensional ones by looking at fitting ideals. Um, um, as usual in this lecture, we're not actually going to prove any of this. I'm just going to work out an example. So let's work out the example we had earlier, where we take R to be the ring of polynomial power series in three variables, modulo x squared, x, y, um, y, z, z squared, y squared minus x, z. And we're going to take m to be the maximal ideal. And we're going to work out the fitting ideals of m. And we're going to work out not just the zeroth fitting ideal, but all the other fitting ideals just for practice and working out fitting ideals. So m is a module with three generators, x, y, and z. And actually it gets a bit confusing because the generators for module m are also elements of the ring R that we're working over. And, and it's sort of rather confusing trying to remember whether you're thinking of x as being a generator of this module or as an element of the ring. Anyway, let's write down a matrix of relations for the module M. Um, so it's got three generators, which we think of as X, Y, and Z, and these are generators of it as a module. And we have the following relation, X, zero, zero. This comes from the um, relation X squared equals zero. You see X times this generator is zero, so we get this as, a, as one of the relations. And then we have the relation y x equals zero, and this just get, actually gives us two rows because y times this generator is zero, but also x times this generator is zero. So x, y x gives us two generators, and similarly z squared gives us zero, zero, z, and y z equals zero gives us zero, z, zero, 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 y, 
and y squared e equals xc gives us a couple more generators, 0, y, x, z, y, 0. So this, this sort of says that z times x plus y times y is equal to 0. So I guess I should put in some minus signs there. So here we've got a, a largish matrix giving us the relations defining m as a module. And now we can work out the fitting ideal. So let's first of all work out the zero fitting ideal of m. Well, for this, we have to take all three by three minors of our matrix and work out the determinant. Well, the determinant is going to be a product of um, three e things, each of which is x, y, z, or zero. And the product of any three elements of these generators is automatically zero. So the zero fitting ideal is just zero. So by the criterion, we see R is not a local complete intersection ring, because if it was a local complete intersection, the zero fitting ideal would have to be zero. While we're about it, let's work out the first fitting ideal. Well, this is given by two by two determinants. And here you can see um, there are various two by two determinants you can get. For instance, if we take this row and this row, we get xz. Well, xz is actually a generator for the um, ideal m squared. So you remember this, the, the, this ideal has length 5. So we have r contained in m contained in m squared. This is length 1. This is length 4. And this is length 5. Now, all 2 by 2 determinants will lie inside m squared. And m squared is only one dimension. So as soon as you've got one non-zero element, you've got the whole of m squared. So the first fitting ideal of m is just m squared, which is equal to, say, the ideal generated by xz. What about the second fitting ideal of m? Well, this is going to be generated by all the one by one determinants. And the one by one determinants are just the entries. So we get x, y, and z. So this is the ideal x, y, and z which is just the whole ideal m. And what about the third fitting ideal of m? Well, this is going to be generated by zero by zero determinants. And if you sort of think about it a bit, the zero by zero determinant always has value one. So this ideal is going to be the ideal generated by one, which is the whole of r. So we've now worked out all the fitting ideals of this module, and in particular, um, by using the criterion we mentioned earlier, we see that the ring is not a local complete intersection ring. Um, well, that's a zero dimensional example with lots of nil potent elements. Um, let's have a sort of more geometric example without nil potent elements. So here's a one dimensional reduced example. You remember reduced means no nil potent elements, so it actually looks like a, um, something coming from a classical geometric object. Um, and for this we're going to take one of the examples we did last time. So you remember we had the, um, one of the rings we had was the Gorenstein ring where we take all polynomials generated by t to the 5, t to the 6, t to the 7 and t to the 8. So you remember this is um, essentially the, the local ring of a certain embedding of the affine line into four-dimensional space with some sort of weird cusp at the origin. Um, so we want to, we, we, we saw it's Gorenstein um, some, for some um, earlier lecture. Now let's show that this is not a local complete intersection. Well, what we have to do is um, quotient by a non-zero divisor. And um, unless you're trying to make life difficult for yourself, you're going to choose the non-zero divisor to be t to the 5. And we worked out the quotient by t to the 5 last time, and it, it had um, um, length five, and we saw there was a basis 
of it consisting of 1, t to the 6, t to the 7, t to the 8, and t to the 14. And let's show that this is not a complete intersection ring. Well, that's easy, because if we call these elements 1, x, y, z, then we see that this element here is x, z, and it's also equal to y squared. So this ring is just k, x, y, z, quotient out by all this stuff we had last time, x squared, x, y, y, z, z squared, x, z minus y squared, which we've just seen was not a local complete intersection ring. So, so here we've got a nice geometric example of a ring that is Gorenstein, but not a local complete intersection. So to finish off with, we can just sort of summarise how to test a local ring for being Gorenstein or local complete intersection or whatever. So, so we're going to um, have a sort of flow chart for what you do if someone presents you with a ring and demands to know which nice properties it has. So this is going to be, let's assume it's notarian and local, because I can't be bothered to work out whether we need it to be notarian or not. So first of all, we work out what is the dimension. And suppose the dimension is greater than zero. Then we ask, is there a non-zero divisor in the maximal ideal M. And if there's no, then it's not Cohen-Macaulay because we've got a positive dimensional ring and we can't find any regular sequence of length greater than zero. Suppose we can. Then what we do is we quotient by it and when we've quotiented out by it we go back to case series. So we, we keep reducing the dimension by quotient out by a, by a non-zero divisor until it becomes dimension zero. So suppose the dimension is zero, what do we do? Well, then we can test to see whether it's Gorenstein. So we work out the dimension of hom over k, so hom over r from k to r. And there are two possibilities. First of all, if it's greater than one, then it's not Gorenstein. I should have said here, when it's zero dimensional, it's certainly Cohen Macaulay. So um, we can then, the next step is to work with it as Gorenstein. Then what we do is we work out the fitting ideal of the maximal ideal M, as we mentioned earlier. And there are two cases. If it's equal to zero, then our ring is not local complete intersection. I should have said um, in this case if it's equal to one the ring is Gorenstein and we then test for being local complete intersection. So now we've found that it is a local complete intersection. Um, and now let's look at the, the, the dimension as a vector space over the field K. And if the dimension is 1, then the ring is regular. Um, what if the dimension is not 1? Or greater than 1? Well, you might say, well, then we can say the ring is not regular, but we can't really, because um, you can take a regular ring and quotient it out by something and get quotient up by regular sequence and get a ring that isn't regular. In fact, that's more or less the definition of a local complete intersection ring. So what do you do if this dimension is not one? Well, then, th th then you have a look and you see, uh, you, you, you go back to these non-zero divisors. Um, were any of the non-zero divisors in M squared? And if, if the answer is no, then the ring is not regular. Because what you were doing was quotienting out by non by non-zero devices that were actually non-zero elements of m modulo m squared. Well, um, what if some of them were not n squared? Well, then you did something stupid. Um, and you should go back and 
um, pick a collection of non-zero divisors that are in m but not in m squared. So you should go back here and start all over again. So that's a sort of rough flowchart of how you how you test local rings for um, these properties. Um, okay, the next um, two or three lectures are going to be about an application of commutative algebra to the Bernstein-Sato polynomial.